What do fuselage narrowing, fuselage bumps, and engines in front of wings all have in common? They're all results of what is called the Coke bottle rule, area rule, or the Whitcomb rule, which reduces drag due to shock waves in the transonic region. But how are all these features related? Today we'll be looking at the area rule, its discovery, physical explanation, and practical application. So to get started, we need a quick review of what goes on in transonic and supersonic flow. Supersonic flow is when the speed of the air completely meets or exceeds the speed of sound. And transonic flow is a mix of subsonic and supersonic flow and can be quite unpredictable. At Mach 1, shock waves can begin to form, which create huge amounts of entropy and reduces the amount of useful energy within the system. And this loss of useful energy due to a shock wave is called wave drag. Air accelerates over the top of a wing. So even if an aircraft isn't traveling at Mach 1, the air over the wing might be supersonic. This means that the plane is in the transonic region and could be experiencing significant wave drag. Airliners operate in this range, often traveling at speeds around Mach 0.8. You can find videos online of people seeing odd disturbances over the wings of airliners. These aren't always present and especially aren't always easily visible, but it is something that can happen. There was a time when we didn't understand supersonic and transonic flow very well. If you've seen my Bell X1 video, no you haven't, only like 8 people watched it, but I give a little background on the mysteries surrounding this region. Back then it was thought that drag at Mach 1 could tear a plane apart, but even when this was disproven, mystery still remained. In the early 1950s, Convair wanted to make their first ever supersonic fighter, the F-102 Delta Dagger. It was designed to operate at a speed of Mach 1.2, but it couldn't even break Mach 1. Tests in NACA's Langley wind tunnel suggested that the transonic wave drag was too high. A man named Richard Whitcomb worked at this wind tunnel at Langley with John Stack from the X-1 video that you didn't watch. Um, and in 1949 and 1950, Whitcomb investigated transonic flow in this wind tunnel and proposed tests to determine a configuration that would minimize wave drag in the transonic region. These tests were unsuccessful, as no configuration showed a significant reduction in wave drag. Further experiments showed that the shock waves at Mach 1 were much larger than expected, but no one understood why. Whitcomb was stumped, but his breakthrough eventually came a few weeks later after Dr. Adolf Buseman gave a technical symposium at Langley. He described the flow in the transonic region as pipes with rigidly fixed diameters, but at subsonic speeds, these pipes were more malleable and became skinnier at high subsonic speeds. Whitcomb was later sitting at his desk contemplating his shockwave issue and his pipe metaphor when he suddenly had an idea. NASA says, quote, the shockwaves were larger than anticipated, he realized, because the stream tubes did not get narrower or change shape, meaning that any local increase in area or drag would affect the entire configuration in all directions and for a greater distance. More importantly, that meant that in trying to reduce the drag, he could not look at the wing and fuselage as separate entities. He had to look at the entire cross-sectional area of the design and try to keep it as smooth a curve as possible as it increased and decreased around the fuselage, wing, and tail. In an instant of clarity and inspiration, he had discovered the area rule. Skybrary defines Whitcomb's area rule as, quote, The rule says that two airplanes with the same longitudinal cross-sectional area distribution have the same wave drag, independent of how the area is distributed laterally, for example, in the fuselage or wing. So in more basic terms, the area rule is a design principle that avoids dramatic changes in the cross-sectional area of a plane. So you can see from this diagram here how the cross-sectional area varies along the length of the plane you see the contribution of the fuselage and the wing and this could be even worse if this wing wasn't as swept back this could be a much uh, greater increase and this wouldn't vary as smoothly um, and you can see how the area rule affects this it cuts down the cross-sectional area of the fuselage right here and makes the total cross-sectional area here completely decrease it smooths over this whole change in cross-sectional area here You can see this applied to the F-102 here in this diagram. Uh, first of all, this line here, the semicircle, 
represents the ideal cross-sectional area distribution along the plane. Um, and this original model here with no area ruling, uh, it's, it's very messy, and especially right here. This huge drop-off is quite nasty. Uh, it doesn't really flow smoothly. With the area ruling, it conforms much closer to the ideal, and the drastic changes are much more decreased. The distribution of the cross-sectional area along the length of the plane must vary smoothly to reduce wave drag. When the F-102 designers visited Langley with their transonic wave drag problem in 1952, the response of the NACA engineers was to implement Whitcomb's area rule. At that point, Whitcomb hadn't fully fleshed out his idea, but the engineers still implemented the concept. The F-102 was modified to have a pinched fuselage right at the wing which reduced the sudden increase in cross-sectional area at that point. In October of 1953, this new design proved that it could meet the Air Force's expectations, but changing the design this late into the production meant problems with manufacturing and cost. The production of the original model went forward, but its failures meant that the redesign was not forgotten. When the Air Force heard of this modified F-102, they told Convair that their contract would be canceled if they did not receive a modified F-102 that met their requirements. So then on December 24, 1954, Convair flew the F-102A and broke Mach 1 in its initial climb and in level flight. The implementation of the area rule increased the speed of the aircraft by about 25%. The area rule is still prevalent today. Going back to our introductory example, the B-1 has what looks like a narrowed waist, which is a feature described as a Coke bottle. For initial designs of the 747, they tried to make the bump at the front as small as possible, but eventually extended it backwards. You can see how it begins to shrink right around the area where the wings start. And the area rule is also why some planes have engines that are mounted ahead of the wings. The discovery and implementation of the area rule is a great example of an idea that was unconventional, but was proven to be an important and valuable concept. Whitcomb's pondering over multiple perspectives of his roadblock led to a very important breakthrough in his work. So this isn't just a story about a groundbreaking concept, but it's a lesson on how engineers should think, constantly generating and pondering new ideas and evaluating problems from new perspectives. Many planes are still affected by the area rule today. If you're ever at an air show, museum, or even an airport, try to see if you notice any features that could be a result of the area rule. If you made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. Um, I'm sorry for not having posted in a little while after I uploaded my last video. My laptop just completely died, and I had to send it in and get repaired, so I couldn't work on any scripting, recording, or editing. Uh, but I'm back now, and I hope to have more videos coming out soon. Again, thanks for watching. Bye.